who is this King of Glory? He, the Lord of hosts, He is the King of Glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you who have come in your abundant mercy. Dear brothers and sisters, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works. Today we herald with the whole church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's Paschal mystery, that is to say, of his passion and resurrection. For it was to accomplish this mystery that he entered his own city of Jerusalem. Therefore, with all faith and devotion, let us follow in his footsteps, so that, being made by his grace partakers of the cross, we may have a share also in his resurrection and in his life. Firstly, Bishop Jonathan has asked me to make clear that I have access to the church building in a way that is safe because it shares its curtilage with that of my home. Those who are facilitating our worship and enabling it to be live screened are members of my household, and we are following the guidelines of the London College of Bishops in all our live streaming services. And now to prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries of Christ's love, let us first call to mind the past. Reading from the prophet Isaiah, the Lord has given me a disciple's tongue, so that I may know how to reply to the weary. He provides me with speech. Each morning he wakes me to hear, to listen like a people. The Lord has opened my ear. For my part, I make no resistance, neither did I turn away. I offered my back to those who struck me my cheek to those who tore at my birth. I did not cover my face against insult and spittle. The Lord comes to my help, so that I am untouched by the insult. So too I set my face like flint. I know I shall not be ashamed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All who see me deriding, they curl their lips, they toss their heads. He trusted in the Lord, let him save him. Let him release him if this is his friend. My, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many dogs have surrounded me, a band of the wicked beset me. They tear holes in my hands and my feet. I can count every one of my bones. My, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They divide my clothing among them. They cast lots for my robe. O oh Lord, do not leave me alone. My strength, make haste to help me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I will tell of your name to my brethren, and praise you where they are assembled. You who fear the Lord, give him praise. All sons of Jacob, give him glory. Revere him, Israel's son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. His state was divine, yet Christ Jesus did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave, and became as men are, and being as all men are, he was humbler yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high, and gave him the name which is above all other names, so that all beings in the heavens, on earth, and in the underworld should bend the knee at the name of Jesus, and that every tongue should acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He replied, Go to so and so in the city and say to him, The master says, My time is near. It is at your home that I am keeping Passover with my disciples. The disciples did what Jesus told them and prepared the Passover. When the evening came, he was at table with the twelve disciples. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you solemnly, one of you is about to betray me. They were greatly distressed and started asking him in turn. Not I, Lord, surely. He answered, Someone who has dipped his hand into the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man is going to his fate, as the Scriptures say he will. But alas for the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, who was to betray him, asked in his turn, Not I, Rabbi, surely. Jesus answered, They are your own words. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and when he had said the blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it and eat. 
This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had returned thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of you from this, for this is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is to be poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. From now on I tell you, I shall not drink wine until the day I drink the new wine with you in the kingdom of my Father. After psalms had been sung, they left for the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all lose faith in me this night, for the scripture says, I shall strike a shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after my resurrection, I shall go before you to Galilee. At this Peter said, Though all lose faith in you, I will never lose faith. Jesus answered him, I tell you solemnly this very night, before the cock crows, you will have disowned me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus came with them to a small estate called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Stay here while I go over there to he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him. And sadness came over him, and great distress. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Wait here, and keep awake with me. And going on a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, let it be as you, not I, would have it. He came back to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you have not the strength to keep awake with me one hour. You should be awake and pray not to be put to the test. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went and prayed. My father, if this cup cannot pass by without my drinking it, your will be done. And he came back again and found them sleeping. Their eyes were so heavy. Leaving them there, he went away again and prayed for the third time, repeating the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and said to them, You can sleep on now and take your rest. Now the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us go. My betrayer is already close at hand. He was still speaking when Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him a large number of men, armed with swords and clubs, sent by the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the traitor had arranged a sign with them. He had said, The one I kiss, he is the man, take him in charge. So he went straight up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, My friend, do what you are here for. Then they came forward, seized Jesus, and took him in charge. At that, one of the followers of Jesus grasped his sword and drew it. He struck out the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said, Put your sword back, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, who would promptly send more than twelve legions of angels to my defence? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled? that say this is the way it must be. It was at that time that Jesus said to the crowds, Am I a brigand that you have to set out to capture me with swords and clubs? I sat teaching in the temple day after day, and you never laid hands on me. Now all this happened to fulfil the prophecies in Scripture. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. The men who had arrested Jesus 
led him off to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Peter followed him at a distance, and when he reached the high priest's palace, he went in and sat down with the attendants to see what the end would be. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus, however false, on which they might pass the death sentence. But they could not find any, though several lying witnesses came forward. Eventually, two stepped forward and made a statement. This man said, I have power to destroy the temple of God and in three days build it up. The high priest then stood up and said to him, Have you no answer to that? What is this evidence these men are bringing against you? But Jesus was silent, and the high priest said to him, I put you on oath by the living God to tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus answered, The words are your own. Moreover, I tell you that from this time onward, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. At this the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. What need of witness have we now? There, you have just heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? They answered, He deserved to die. Then they spat in his face, and hit him with their fists. Others said, as they struck him, Slay the prophet Christ, who hit you then. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilee. But he denied it in front of them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him, and said to the people there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, with an oath, he denied it. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, You are one of them for sure. Why, your accent gives you away. Then he started calling down curses on himself and swearing, I do not know the man. At that moment the cock crew, and Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will have disowned me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people met in council to bring about the death of Jesus. They had him bound and led him away to hand him over to Pilate, the governor. When he found that Jesus had been condemned, Judas, his betrayer, was filled with remorse and took the thirty pieces of silver back to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. They replied, What is that to us? That is your concern. And flinging down the silver pieces in the sanctuary, he made off and went and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the silver pieces and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury. It is blood money. So they discussed the matter and bought the potter's field with it as a graveyard for foreigners. And this is why the field is called the field of blood today. The words of the prophet Jeremiah were then fulfilled, and they took the thirty silver pieces, the sum at which the precious one was priced by the children of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, just as the Lord directed me. Jesus, then, was brought before the governor, and the governor put it to him this question, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, It is you who say it. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he refused to answer at all. 
Pilate then said to him, Do you not hear how many charges they have brought against you? But to the governor's complete amazement, he offered no reply to any of the charges. At festival time, it was the governor's practice to release a prisoner for the people, anyone they chose. Now there was at that time a notorious prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate said to them, Which do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ. For Pilate knew it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. Now, as he was seated in the chair of judgment, his wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that man. I have been upset all day by a dream I heard about him. The chief priests and the elders, however, had persuaded the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas and the execution of Jesus. So when the governor spoke and asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What am I to do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. Pilate asked, Why? What harm has he done? But they shouted all the louder, Let him be crucified. Then Pilate saw that he was making no impression, that in fact a riot was imminent. So he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood, let it be your concern. And the people, to a man, shouted back, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. He ordered Jesus to first be scourged and then handed over to be crucified. The governor's soldiers took Jesus with them into the praetorium and collected the whole cohort round him. Then they stripped him and made him wear a scarlet cloak. And having twisted some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head and placed a reed in his right hand. To make fun of him, they knelt to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him, and took the reed, and struck him on the head with it. And when they had finished making fun of him, they took off the cloak, and dressed him in his own clothes, and led him away to crucify him. On their way out, they came across a man from Cyrene, Simon by name, and enlisted him to carry his cross. When they had reached a place called Golgotha, that is, the place of the skull, they gave him wine to drink. When they had finished crucifying him, they shared out his clothing by casting lots, and then sat down and stayed there keeping guard over Above his head was placed the charge against him. It read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At the same time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. The passers-by jeered at him. They shook their heads and said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He put his trust in God. Now let God rescue him if he wants him. For he did say, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him taunted him in the same way. From the sixth hour there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? When some of those who stood there heard this, they said, The man is calling on Elijah. And one of them quickly ran to get a sponge, which he dipped in vinegar, 
and, putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. The rest of them said, Away, see if Elijah will come to save him. But Jesus, again crying out in a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks were split, the tombs opened, and the bodies of many holy men rose from the dead. And these, after his resurrection, came out of the tombs, entered the holy city, and appeared to a number of people. Meanwhile, the centurion together with the others guarding Jesus, had seen the earthquake and all that was taking place, and they were terrified and said, In truth, this was a son of God. And many women were there, watching from a distance, the same women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and looked after him. Among them were Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When it was the evening, there came a certain rich man of Arimathea called Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate thereupon ordered it to be handed over. So Joseph took the body wrapped it in a clean shroud, and put it in his own tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a large stone across the entrance of the tomb, and went away. Now Mary of Magdala and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the sepulchre. Next day, that is, when preparation day was over, the chief priests and the Pharisees went in a body to Pilate and said to him, Your Excellency, we, we recall that this impostor said, While he was still alive, after three days I shall rise again. Therefore, give the order to have the sepulchre kept secure until the third day, for fear his disciples come and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. This last piece of fraud would be worse than what went before. Pilate said to him, You may have your guard. Go and make all us secure as you know. So they went and made the sepulchre secure, putting seals on the stone and mounting a guard. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today, Palm Sunday, is supposed to be a day of gathering, of processions and crowds, of hosannas and celebration. As we enact liturgically Jesus' entry into Jerusalem that began the final week of his life, and the passion and death that he would undergo for our salvation. This year, given the extraordinary circumstances in which we all find ourselves, there is no gathering, there are no crowds or processions. The mood being that of a liturgical action that takes place later this week, that of Tenebrae, and the opening words of the first lesson at that service, Quemodo sedet sola civitas, how doth the city sit solitary that was once full of people? Those being the first words of the book of the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Our city, our churches, that were full of people, 
are now as empty as was the city of Jerusalem, over which Jeremiah lamented. And yet, in spite of how we might be feeling today, in the face of the suffering and death that we are witnessing around the world, the song of Palm Sunday remains Hosanna, and the one whom we greet and worship on this day remains the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one whose own suffering and death we contemplate in this holy week, and whose resurrection brings us hope and joy, even in the midst of our current anxiety, isolation and despair. It's no secret that the liturgies of the latter part of Holy Week, particularly Maundy Thursday and Holy Saturday, are not particularly well attended by the majority of Christian people. Even Good Friday, some find too much to bear. And yet this year, it is only a very few, almost entirely clerical Christians, who will enact the rites and liturgies that so characterise this time of year on behalf of us all. And even for those of us who are so privileged to be able to do that, those liturgies have been necessarily stripped back to their bare essentials. No procession today, no washing of the feet or altar of repose on Maundy Thursday, no public veneration of the cross on Good Friday, no new fire, or blessing of the font at the Easter Vigil. It might feel as if, just as the freedoms that we take so for granted have been taken from us for a while, so too the Church is paring back the liturgy to its bare bones, to the essential core of its action and meaning, served and enacted only by a skeleton staff. For many Christians, the loss of, and the inability to participate in, the public and dramatic liturgies of Holy Week and Easter will be a particularly heavy cross to bear. For the liturgy is the work of the whole people of God, not just the preserve and privilege of the clergy, even if extraordinarily this year it must be so. But the God whom we worship in our public liturgies, the God of Jesus Christ, who enters our condition so fully that he shares our suffering and death, is the God who, because of the extraordinary events of Holy Week and Easter, is still with us in these extraordinary times. Our God is not one who is distant, far off, separated from his creation. No, he is the one who, because of the Incarnation, is with us and for us, at our best and at our worst, at our beginning and at our end. And he is with us even though we may not be able to meet together, to worship and pray together, and most importantly, to receive the sacraments of Holy Church together. For the vast majority of Christians, this Holy Week will be overwhelmingly characterised by the feelings and emotions of Good Friday. Isolation, emptiness, desolation and mourning. But the God who in Jesus Christ is with us in all things, is with us still. And have no doubt about it, he is at work in his people, in you and in me, even though at present we may be parted from one another, and not be able to offer him that public worship, which is both our duty and our joy. And perhaps the lesson that God is longing for us to learn in this holy week is not only a deep gratitude for the Church's liturgy and music, and for divine worship as we offer it in this Church, but also, and just as importantly, a deep gratitude for one another, for those who sit beside and around us in the now empty pews, 
to whose lives we abound inextricably through our baptism into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And this gratitude, this love for what we have temporarily lost, extends beyond the confines of our liturgical worship and our fellowship as Christians in this place. For it extends to our whole lives as individuals, as families, and as a society at large. For it is a love and a gratitude that is outward-looking, a love and a gratitude that is transformed into service of the God whom we worship in the service of our neighbour, our fellow human beings who share with us the image and likeness of God, and for whom, for all of whom, our Lord Jesus Christ suffered died and rose again in the momentous days that lie ahead of us in this week. In a holy week that will undoubtedly for many be more characterised by the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, than Hosanna this week. It is vitally important that we Christians place our hope in and draw our strength from the familiar events of the coming days. For they not only define who we are, both as individuals and as a community in Christ, but they also give meaning to the situation in which we currently find ourselves, to the suffering and death of those whom we love, and ultimately our own. And even in the darkness of our desolation, they shine as the inextinguishable light of Jesus Christ, guiding us through all our Good Fridays with the hope and promise of the transformation and healing of Easter Day. Whatever other graces this Holy Week might bring, if it can open our hearts in deeper thanksgiving to God for our Church, its worship, our congregation and one another, then it will have done a great work. And if that gratitude overflows into a deeper love for God, his church and one another, then for that, if for no other reason, we can join together with confidence and in faith in shouting Hosanna today. Amen.
in the power of the Holy Spirit and in union with Christ Jesus, we bring our prayers to our Heavenly Father. For Christian people, that through the suffering of not being able to worship publicly nor receive the sacraments, they may grow closer to Christ through prayer, spiritual communion, and the service of others in Jesus' name. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who govern us, and for all involved in the global effort to halt the spread of the coronavirus pandemic, especially doctors, nurses, hospital staff, emergency workers, and those involved in medical research, that they may be granted dedication, strength, and resolve in their work. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those in the darkness of isolation, that they may find support and encouragement from this Christian community. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who are weighed down with suffering, hardship, failure, or sorrow, and feel that God is far from them, that they may know the healing, consolation, and peace that Christ alone can bring. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who have died in faith, especially those who have died from coronavirus, that they may find mercy in the day of Christ. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. That our prayers may be joined with those of St. Benedict and all the saints, and especially those of Our Lady, as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. In a few moments of silence, we offer our own needs and concerns to our Heavenly Father. Lord God, your servant and son, speaks the word that revives the weary and humbles himself to carry the cross that saves us. As we enter this holy week, empty us of ourselves and draw us closer to Christ crucified, that looking upon the one who called out to you as forsaken, we may acknowledge him to be truly the Son of God. May every tongue join in confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that by sacrificing yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hearts for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all the Holy Church. Giving him 
thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when the sample was ended, he took the chalice, and giving him thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign, 
away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Thanks be to God. 